So this session is going to be all about marketing. And I'm really looking forward to spending the, nice, the next 90 minutes with you talking about marketing, marketing, and more marketing. Before we start talking about what you did and what you want to do and what the problems are and all of that, I want to start by just focusing your mind on why are we even talking about marketing. What is marketing? Just shout it out. What would you say that is marketing? Getting leads. That's the result of marketing. You get leads. OK. Guys, you guys that are entering the room, all the seats from the mics forward has been, have been sanitized, so please take a seat. The only thing that we ask is that you stay on that seat for the rest of the, night, the five sessions, because those are going to be your seats. OK, so the result of marketing, for sure, is getting leads. What else? What is marketing? Yes, perfect. So getting the word out there about your business, who you are, your mission, why you exist, the change that you are here to make, why does it matter for them, right? It's about communicating a message. What else? Somebody else? What's marketing besides all of that? Who you're not for, you are not for right? So one of the things that you want to do with your marketing is to polarize the marketplace. Your business is not for everyone. Hopefully, all of you have taken the time to create your ideal client avatar. If you have an ideal client avatar, you have taken the time to define what an A plus or A type client is, what would make a client a B client, a C client, and you're definitely not taking or tolerating any C's, D's, E's, and F, et cetera, right? That's a big part of what we do. So in order for you to put any marketing out there, do any video, any newsletters, any webinars, any, any kind of marketing, the, the idea is that you're very, very clear about what is the message that you want to send to the marketplace so you get more of those people that you are looking for and hopefully none or very few of the ones that are not ideal for your business. They might do and have an am amazing experience with some other law firm and some other lawyer that is just not you. Make sense? HTM is not for everyone. We are very clear, as you all know, because you are members, and those of you on the Zoom that you are not members, you'll know that now, uh, we have a very clear no assholes policy. So, and that's defined on our manifesto that Arjun wrote and our SOPs. So if anyone exhibits that kind of behavior, obviously, number one, we, would, we wouldn't allow them to engage our services. Number two, we would take them out very nicely from this community and suggest that they join another one, but this is not the place for them. So going back to marketing. Marketing is anything and everything that you do to communicate to the world that your business exists. And what is that your business can do for them? Marketing is not about you. Yes, of course, you're going to communicate your story as the owner of your law firm, and you're going to connect with potential clients, but only you're only going to tell those stories that are going to help people understand why is that your story matters for them. So why should I pay attention to you? You know, one of the great um, marketing minds that I enjoy listening and learning from is Seth Godin. And he has a phenomenal book that is called Purple Cows. And one of the things, if you haven't read it, I totally recommend it. He has two phenomenals. Uh, one is, I mean, all of them are good. But uh, Purple Cow is great. And all marketers are liars. It's very good. Um, and one of the things that he says is, Great marketing should continue the communication, the narrative, the story that your ideal client is already thinking about. So unless you know what your ideal client is already thinking about, problems, what are their pain points, what are their frustrations, what are their dreams, what are their aspirations, how is their life like? 
And you can speak to that reality. Unless you do that, your marketing is not going to connect with them. Because we as human beings, we are thinking, our, our mind is tuned into this radio station that we call WIIFM. What is in it for me? And if I see something or something is around me that I am not interested on or I don't relate to, my mind will automatically block it out. I won't even see it. Has any of you ever had the experience that, I don't know, I have ladies and men in the room, so let me go with a ladies example first and then a men example. When, if you remember when you were pregnant for the first time, right, suddenly you were pregnant or you're thinking about getting pregnant and you're seeing pregnant women everywhere. Everywhere you go, you see a woman being pregnant because now your mind is paying attention to that. Or when we used to go to shopping malls and those things, you go into the shopping mall and if you have small children or teenagers or whatever, you notice the clothes for small children. You notice the games. You notice this, you notice that. For you men, maybe when you're thinking about getting a new car, maybe an Audi, maybe a Porsche, Yes, a Porsche, I know, okay. A Porsche or a, an Audi or a Tesla or whatever it is that you're looking for, you suddenly start seeing those cars everywhere. You know, last year, my son uh, turned 16. Last year? Yes, 2020, he turned 16. And he wanted an Audi, what was it? Oscar's not in the room, I can't remember. It's an Audi um, S6, I think he wanted, S4, no, S6. He wanted an Audi S6 in gray carbon fiber, whatever, whatever. So every time for a whole year from when he was 15 to 16, every time that we would start driving somewhere, he would say every time, three or four times in the car, Mom, there's my car. Mom, there's my car. Mom, look at that. You know, he would see them everywhere. And before, I mean, of course, we saw Audis here and there, but not that many. So we have this thing in our mind because there's so many things happening around us that if we're not looking for something, sometimes we don't even see it. And when you start looking for something or when you're interested in something, suddenly you start, they start popping everywhere. Yes, can you relate to that? Some people, anyone, can you guys relate to that? Yes, okay. So that is actually a defend, defense mechanism that our minds have to block out all the things that do not interest us. So going back to your marketing, how is that you are communicating stories through your marketing? People are 80% emotional. People make decisions 80% with their emotions. And they justify it with logic. I promise you, if any of you is wearing a Rolex or owns a Tesla or wants to buy a car or is thinking about um, I don't know, let me see, getting a sub-zero refrigerator, <laughs> right? You find that thing that you want because it makes you feel something. None of you need a Rolex on your wrist. None of you need a Tesla. None of you need a $3 million house. We don't need those things. A $20 or $15 watch from Walmart is more than enough for us to look at the hour, but we want a Rolex, or ladies, right? We want a Louis Vuitton bag, or we want a Chanel bag, or whatever it is. Why do we want those things? Because it makes us feel something. And then we justify it with logic. Oh my God, it's so beautiful, right? It's, I absolutely need a Tesla because it's so secure. It will save so much gas, right? So. What is that your ideal client, and this is a question that I want you to please write down on your workbook. What is that you want your client to feel when they engage your services? Why would a client engage your services versus someone else's law firm? And don't tell me because you're a better lawyer, because you know the law better. That's not why they are going to engage your services only. Obviously, that's important. But how do you think that your ideal client wants to feel 
when they engage the services of a law firm like yours. So think about yourself. If you are a criminal law attorney, an immigration attorney, a family attorney, if you had to hire somebody for the kinds of services that you provide, what would you be looking for? Um, two more things. Clients are the lifeblood of your business. If you don't have clients, you don't have a business. So your responsibility as the owner of your own business is to find and do biz development, biz dev, biz development, marketing. So you can attract clients that are the lifeblood of your business. And your income your income is going to be determined by the value your business provides plus the number of offers that you make. It's numbers. It, it's all about the numbers. How many offers are you making on a daily basis? How many offers is your law firm making on a daily basis or on a weekly basis? And when I say you are making, maybe you have a dragon, maybe it's not you. But you cannot make offers if you don't have people interested. And if you're not doing biz dev, if you're not doing marketing, you won't have people interested just because you are not finding them. It is your responsibility as the owner of the law firm to put your business in front of people. It is not your potential new client's responsibility to find you. Okay? So, there is this thing that is called educational marketing, in which you put out marketing videos, newsletters, webinars, um, speaking engagements, networking events, referral marketing, all kinds of marketing where you educate people, either you're educating your referral sources or you're educating the marketplace on the need for services like yours. And that's how you can start attracting more clients. So, I want you to please go to page 14 and I am going to give you five minutes to answer this question. What are some of the things that the pandemic created enough pressure on and got you to finally start doing in your firm's marketing? So things that maybe you were thinking and you knew that you had to do before, but you were putting off or you were not prioritizing. And then when the pandemic hit, you went like, holy guacamole, holy cow, whatever. I need to start doing this. I must do it right now. What are some of the things that when the pandemic hit, you were forced or pressured or you just decided that you needed to start doing regarding the marketing of your law firm? Please fill it out on page 14. What did you start doing that we're forced to do with the pandemic? We started running TV commercials again, which was real, I mean, COVID hit in March and by April 1, we had TV commercials on three stations, which was really beneficial, it kind of saved us. That's phenomenal, that's phenomenal. Um, Julie, are you in the room? Is there any way that we can help Dustin so he doesn't have to be... No, no, these are good for my quads. I didn't go to the gym uh, this morning. This quads? is perfect. Okay, good. This is perfect. Okay, good. Um, just because I have a little bit of inside information, a little bit, Dustin, um, can you tell us a little bit about the experience that you had with your radio ads? What happened that you initially thought that the, it was not a good investment and then it just turned out um, that it is a good investment? So with the, with the ads, I didn't think it was a good investment because... Thank you, Julie. Get all my germs off there. 
I didn't think it was a good investment because I wasn't calculating the return correctly. So I was spending a ton of money and I was only, I was only looking at the spend versus the direct correlation to, uh, to the direct um, revenue that was derived from those ads. So somebody saw an ad, they came in and paid me. What I didn't take into account was kind of the, the halo effect that the television station, the, the television ads had on people coming in from other sources. They would see my ad, they would go to Google, they would talk to a friend, and then they would come in, and so the ad didn't get credit for it. And I also didn't take into account the lifetime value of the client, the fact that they saw my ad, that we mailed them a guide, they read it, and six months later they ended up coming in, and they honestly had forgotten that they had even seen the ad. We asked them, and they're just like, I don't know how I heard, from, heard about you, but I'm here. Here's my credit card. And so we didn't, um, we weren't able to, we didn't accurately, uh, we didn't give enough credit. Right, you weren't looking at the situation from all different angles, but you're just looking at one simple thing that it seemed to make the whole marketing strategy not, um, not have an ROI. Correct. Right. And instead, really, I think it saved us. So we were down 2020 from 2019, but March was, so 2019, we ended at 1.65, 20, and in March of 2020, we did $77,000. I'm like, this can't happen. And so we took all of the reserves that we had and we dumped them into television, radio, direct mail, and, and the TV was kind of the biggest spend. And so that was the easiest one to cut off the top. But um, in fact, I'm in talks with and producing some new commercials right now to go back and kind of double down on it because um, after that intense, uh, intense conversation we had with Arjan, we, um, he helped me realize that the television not only had a good effect, but it was really valuable and we needed to, and the numbers were in fact better than what some marketers expect out of um, their return and we should continue doing it. And so that's what we're going to do. That's phenomenal, thank you. And just for the benefit of everybody in Zoom or in the audience, can you tell them, because you did have a great way to track, like you were tracking all the metrics from the beginning to the end, please none of you ever think about putting any TV ads, radio ads, any, anything m massive that is not, you don't have the way to track. Please. So we were able to track it, and it became difficult to track because even though every television um, ad had its own unique commer or a commercial telephone number, um, there's also a different telephone number on the internet, and I mean, all the different phone numbers we have to track the various ways, so, and, and honestly, people just don't remember where they saw you, and they just right. pick up a phone number and call, but we did track to the best that we could. We tracked everything that came in and the dollars that it generated. Perfect, thank you. So that's what you started doing? That's what we started doing. Okay, what did you stop doing? We stopped doing um, networking meetings and really networking, like one-on-one -on -one and also just the group lunches, networking meetings, like everyone had to stop. And I'm kind of thankful they stopped. Um, I felt like a well-paid, well-fed tourist when I was doing the networking meetings. You just go and have this lunch and listen to somebody drone on about something that you didn't care anything about, hoping to meet somebody that might someday possibly maybe send you a referral. Right. So we did work them, but I'm glad that to do, be doing something else. I was kind of tired of those. Perfect. Okay, good. Yes. Sorry? Oh, oh, can you, yeah, your magic statement, please. Oh, I'm Dustin McFarlane. Um, we, uh, we guide seniors and the people who love them. Um, we're an estate planning and elder law firm. Right, okay, um, good. In Sacramento. So then what I want help with, and this is maybe kind of morbid, so I apologize in advance for not being really PC, but <laughs> I don't know how to say this without people throwing stuff at me. Um, I wanted, I wanted, that's, I anticipated, that's a better phrase, I didn't want it, but I anticipated that COVID was going to have this dramatic effect and really scare people, and we would have a line out the door to get their estate plans done, when in fact, people were actually so afraid they just stuck their head in the sand and they stay at home, and they don't do anything, they're afraid to lose their jobs, so they don't want to spend any money, they're afraid 
that, then, but they're not afraid that they're going to die. And so what I'm trying, so what I want help with is creating more of a sense of urgency. I don't really want to say, the sky, scream the sky is falling, but I do want to help people understand that, you know, that they need to get this done now. And while I don't, while we don't have the, again, I, sorry for not being PC, but we don't have the body count that the media told us we were going to have in the beginning. I mean, it kind of sounded like it was going to be, you know, we were running out of body bags and they wouldn't be able to dig holes fast enough to bury the, you know, the victims of COVID. I know people are dying from them, but it's not to the extent that we thought it, that we were kind of made to, led to believe in the beginning. Uh -huh. um, and yet there is still this, it's still an urgent thing. It's still a, where we're still lo having clients lose family members and to a greater degree than say, you know, the normal illnesses that, uh, that just we, we all lived with pre-pandemic. Right. And so the, I'm trying to figure out the right messaging. And so one of my original television commercials really mentioned COVID and said, hey, COVID is a thing, get in. In fact, the last line of the commercial said, um, because, because tomorrow may be too late or something like that. And so it worked for about two months and then people had kind of COVID fatigue mm -hmm. and it didn't work anymore. So that's right. fine. So we changed it. But trying to find the some sort of messaging that reminds them that this is an urgent situation and we need, you need to act now. Right. And, and doing that in 30 seconds is really difficult. Right. So um, two things that you want to think about. Number one is every, not every, but sometimes the marketing message saturates the mind of people. And if you are the only person, so let's talk about, for example, Nike, right? Just do it one of their best slogans ever that we all know about. But the, when they say that, it's Nike using that slogan. It's sure. Nike's branding. However, when you are talking about COVID and deaths, you and everybody in the world is doing the same. So it gets to a point in which people's minds just shut it down. You're just like, don't tell and me I about that crap anymore. And I think that's what happened. Anymore. Right, that's what happened. So, and again, I think that being able to create the sense of urgency of maybe there's no tomorrow, that's a good slogan, just don't tie it to COVID. So I think that for a 30 second commercial, which is very, yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's like four, three and a half sentences, it's fast. Right, it's really fast. You want to focus on one sentence that will, the, the problem with a consequence, is that the time from when a person makes a decision to when they experience the consequence, there's a lag, right? So they make the decision not to have their state plan done. And then they, a few years later, sometimes several years later, then their families or themselves experience a consequence. So because they are not thinking that this is going to happen to them, then they are dismissing it because it's not urgent today. <laughs> so what I suggest that you do is that you use examples of maybe past clients or situations that you've seen that demonstrate the consequence. So to get the, because we're really, we're looking for an emotional response. We're not looking for an academic like A plus B equals C. We're looking right. for I mean, I want people to cry or to be mad or have some sort of like visceral response to like the I've fallen and I can't get up lady that fell down a flight of stairs and she's laying there and saying, help, help. Right. And you're like, oh, my gosh, this is the worst commercial ever. Like, but it gets an emotional response that people remember and create some sort of angst within them. Right. And I think that the first thing that I would say to you is to really take the time to clarify the specific kind of client that you're looking for. Because based on that, it's going to be different the message that you're gonna give to a 40 year old person that wants to take care of their parents than the message that you're going to give to, let's say a 65 year old male to take care of their children or their mothers or their fathers. It's just different. And each one of those commercials are going to be different. 
So if you sit down and you say, okay, I cannot speak to all of them. I need to speak to one of them. Which one is the, my first priority of the people that I want to attract that have the money to pay me today? Oh, that's a, okay. Then you, based on that one avatar, then you think about one recent past client that you had a great success story with that were exactly that avatar. And then the commercial or the marketing initiative, and by the way, guys, this is for all of you. This is not only for Dustin. The problem with your marketing is that you're trying to speak to everyone. And what did I say earlier? If I'm a mom that I'm pregnant or I'm a pregnant woman, I am not going to pay attention to Audis or to Porsche. I'm going to pay attention to things that have to do with pregnant women and babies. So you're trying to reach everyone and you're not reaching anyone. So for you and for all of you, define the person that you're looking for. Once you define the avatar, you're going to think about a recent client, recent, six months, a year, your best clients, that client that fits that criteria and tell that story with your commercial or your video or whatever the marketing is because you only have 30 seconds. Now, Remember that the marketing is not to convince them to buy. Every single thing that you do in your law firm has different objectives. The marketing will not necessarily create the sense of urgency to purchase. The marketing will create the sense of urgency to make an inquiry. Right. The and marketing that, will get them to the door. Okay. Now the salespeople, that's the person that needs to find the sense of urgency. But the way to find the sense of urgency is based on that specific person's situation. So if you're seeing that not enough people are converting, that's not a marketing issue, that's a sales issue. Because your marketing is getting them to the door. So, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, and so based on this, what I think I'll do is run three different commercials for the three different avatars, two or three different avatars, and kind of see which one, how they perform. And then I will, change the messaging in the sales meeting to really dig into that sense of urgency and that Who, emotional response. The, exactly. You need to sit down with whomever, the dragons or whomever are doing those sales and you need to help them find a sense of urgency. And this is going to talk to, Arjun is going to come next to talk about sales. So when you're talking about the sales, people will only part away with their money if they, th they have enough reasons to buy now. RTBNs, enough reasons to buy right now, which is usually a limiter. You want to put a limiter of time, availability, quantity, price, because if there's no time, there's no urgency. That's a sales problem. But going back to your marketing. Sure. When you're doing radio, TV, etc., it's all about repetition. And obviously you have a limited budget. So I would caution you against doing, using three different commercials at the same time. No, I wouldn't run them simultaneously. It would be a month or two, exactly. and then a month or two. That's and then what a I was going to say. Co yeah. Concentrate all your efforts in one avatar first. Let's see how it goes and what it does, and then the next, and then the next. Make okay. sense? And then just as an aside, I see, and, and my eyes are old, so I can barely see some of the text or the chats that are coming up. I cannot but see any of the chats. But there's been some good suggestions or somebody, and I've, so um, what I, is there any way we could get either these chats or yes. somebody had some suggestions for yes. us that maybe they could either post on the forum or that they could, We're you know, connect through us? We're going to ask the events team to get us the chat, and then you can read the chat. Okay. Can so, we do that, Julie? Is that possible for Dustin, for all of us? And anyway, I just think that there were some people were offering some good ideas and yeah. I couldn't listen and read them fast enough. So right. anyway, just yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Okay. Thanks. Can we line up one person from Zoom and then I'll take an ex another one from live? I got you. Ronald Pollock. Okay. Thank you. Ron. Oh, there you are. Hi, Ron. Um, we have a lot of people lined up here and I'm sure that in Zoom also. So if you can give us like quickly one thing that you stopped doing, one thing that you started doing, and then your question, obviously. Certainly. Uh, the, how are you, Erica, first of all? Um, the one thing I stopped doing 
which is somewhat counterintuitive when people hear about it, but it helped me, was I actually stopped sending out my newsletter um, by email. During the pandemic, people were getting so inundated with emails that they stopped. I use constant contact. They started unsubscribing when I was just sending my newsletters. So what I focused on, I still sent emails, but I made sure the tag phrase were current and on a topic that would either grab their attention, but it wasn't a normal, just a newsletter. Right. And I found that I, um, people were not uh, unsubscribing off of my list, my email list, when I did it like that, as compared to just sending out a newsletter when people were getting so many emails now with pandemic, they just kept unsubscribing. And I'm like, this is crazy. So that was one of the things I stopped doing. Okay. One of the things I started doing to get my list better <laughs> was I started doing webinars. Um, and I did it about all kinds of topics um, that weren't just about what I do. Um, uh, by the way, my name's Ron Pollack. Uh, I fight for people who are injured in accidents and make sure that they know that their claims are about them and the impacts on their life. Um, so the webinars that I did, like the first webinar, I, I've done about seven or eight of them. One of them I did where I actually, one of my cousins is a comedian. And I said, dude, can you help me put on a virtual comedy show and for the community? And he was friends with people nationally. So he had people, I literally had seven nationally rated comedians come on for an hour and I was the moderator, um, cause you know, I'm shy. Um, and uh, I was able to engage and, and put on a comedy show for people in the community and I posted it all over the place. But then I did one on the starting of school and the stress of that. So I got, a social worker slash therapist to talk about the impact that it's having on children as well as parents and things that they could try to do. So those are the things that I've done. I've tried to do, I, I haven't just Ron, talked about myself. We need to forward, fast forward, your question. So you okay. started doing uh, webinars that went really well, that started building your list, fabulous. Yeah. What's but the, the challenge that we need to fix? Okay, the challenge that I need to fix is, I don't know how to get more followers and on my social media stuff. I have, you know, for a while I got, you know, people started following and they still follow. And I have my 1500 or a thousand, whatever the heck it may be, that number is. I can't get it to grow. I, I, well, and, okay, and, hold on a second. What are we really after? Because getting more followers, I don't, where should I look at? So he, Ron can see that I'm looking at him because I'm looking at the TV and I don't know where, oh, you, thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, Ron, what is the ultimate goal that you're after? Because getting followers on social media is a medium to get to a result. What is the result that you want? Certainly. I, because I do plaintiff's personal injury work, unless someone's injured in an accident, I can't just go up to somebody and sell them something. So I need to be, try to get credibility and top of mind awareness so that if someone know somebody or ultimately gets into an accident down the road, they're going to think of me. So my social media, I do a lot of educational posts and things from that perspective. I do FAQ Fridays every single week. I do Mindset Mondays. I do Testimonial Tuesdays. I do different posts to just try to keep it uh, that I'm one of the best in what I do and also that uh, I know what the hell I'm talking about. So I want to get more followers, get, so hopefully people know that. Ron, when yes. you get more followers in social media, you think that you're going to get more what? Why do you want more followers? Because I want a bigger audience in the geographical area that I'm trying to practice so that if people get involved in accidents, they think of me and okay. my firm. So this is, this is the answer to that. And I want to be careful, how do I say this? Because fuck followers. Okay, you don't want followers. What you want is to establish you and your firm as the go-to person for criminal injury in your area. That's what you want. Now, if you focus on the fact, let me just 
I'm always talking about this, guys, and maybe I sound like a broken record, but maybe that's a good thing. Okay. This is the outcome goal. What you're really after is be the go-to person or, or business for criminal law, whatever, whatever. Personal that's injury. the outcome. Personal injury law, but that's Personal okay. Personal injury. Personal PI. Okay. <laughs> that's the outcome. And obviously, even more than that is because we want more clients. Okay? Social media is one strategy. So what you really want to think about more than what do I do in Instagram, <laughs> for example, is what is my marketing strategy? And what is the one place, remember that we say marketing is attracting the right client with the right frame of mind in the right quantity to the right place ready to buy. So if I want to bring to the, my door, let's say, 15 clients per month, whatever the number is. In order to get 15 clients per month, how many leads do I need? You know, basic or basic business plan workshop or advanced business plan workshops that you've done. I need this many number of leads. And based on this number of leads, what are the different marketing strategies that I'm going to do? Maybe for social media, I am doing Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and whatever, right? And I'm also doing webinars, and I am also doing these other strategies. So what you're concerned about is down here, number of followers. And what you really want is up here. So what I would suggest is that you stop getting concerned about followers, and you start getting concerned with strategies. And then if you say part of my social media strategy or part of my strategy, let's say that you have YouTube here. So part of my strategy is that I record three videos a week that then get pushed to all these channels, to a webinar and to a YouTube and then to my newsletter. And these topics get repurposed. So that way, you get leverage. So how do you get more followers is not only by being more popular or appearing more. The problem is that I don't care how many followers you get, Ron. You don't freaking own any of that. And the only people that are going to follow you is the people that the Facebook or the Instagram or the TikTok algorithm is going to decide that they are going to expose your content to. So this is a very, let's call it naked exposed position. You don't own anything. So I'm not saying don't do it, but I am saying each and every one of these webinars, videos, uh, appearances on social media should have all of them. A call to action that goes to your free resource that will sign them up to your email list. And then this run you own. So stop getting concerned with how many people follow me and start getting concerned with leveraging all these social media avenues because at the end of the day, you're going to end up with something like this. YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, add whatever you want, webinars, all of these are going to go to a free resource or several. It doesn't have to be one, but one or two, not 20, right? And all of these free resources, free resource, free resource, all of this is going to lead to your email list. Is Adam Williams here? No, he's in another group. Ask Adam, this is exactly what we did with him. And then he, I think, 
tri 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 triplicated uh, his email list. And then from the email list, we get them to a, in your case, because you're PI, to a consultation, because it's fast. But in the case of family law, other cases, maybe you can create a product that they can buy, like a product that they can buy for, I don't know, I think in the case of Adam was like $97, $197, something like that. Once a person purchases from you something, they purchase something from you. Um, I think Adam did the, the calculator, right? The PPP loan, loan, loan calculator, just a calculator that his wife created on a phenomenal Excel thing. And he was selling it, I think, like for $97, something like that. Once a person pays you $1, they are 400 times more likely to purchase from you again. So that's how you want to think about all roads lead to your email list. And then from your email list, you do more webinars, more stories, more offers, and then they bring them to your door as a client. How do you deal with the fact that, because one of the things that, that I did was, I'm involved with a motorcycle injury group where we were literally giving away a free Harley Davidson. So it was an amazing thing to try to get people to drive them to, to add to my list. And all of a sudden on my social media sites were stop phishing me, stop doing this stuff. And, and, and the things where I'm asking for email addresses to get free resources or to give something away for free, their thinking is fraudulent and you know, and then they started spreading the word on this, only that one issue, but it, it became a huge issue for me. And I had to respond and say, here's what it is. And then I showed a video of last year's winner. And then, you know, I'm going to show the video of this year's winner. But um, how do you deal with that? That people, when you ask for their email address, they don't just either leave you or think you're- You're not problem. going to ask them for their email in social media. In no, no, social I mean, media, I mean, you're going to offer if you are. So this, this goes back to what I, was, what I was telling Dustin earlier. If you have an ideal client avatar, then you tell and you know what their problems are, you know what their pain points are, you know what their desires and goals are, and you're specific, then on your social media you say, if you are looking for help with this, go to this landing page and download the report on how to do exactly that. And then right there, yes, you're asking for their email addresses. And if they don't want to give them to you, the only thing they have to do is click close to the landing page. That's it. Okay. Yep, Thank thanks. you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Okay. Who's, who's next? I can't see your face. So tell me your name. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jason McLaurin. Hi, Jason. Hey. Go uh, ahead. All right, uh, I'm Jason McLaurin from Houston. Uh, I sue insurance companies in any way I can. Um, just to give you a quick background, uh, my practice has kind of moved into two areas all relating to insurance. I have a consumer-based PI and policyholder insurance side, homeowners claims, things like that. And then a business side that's hourly that I'm using to kind of fuel the consumer side to build up, uh, you know, suing insurance companies for them. Mm -hmm. So what I had a problem is that the consumer side grew this year, so we won't talk about that, but the business side, which was really generated from going to complimentary, like the seminars that I think Dustin was talking about, where you're going to complimentary professions, construction, things like that, making relationships and having them refer business, uh, stopped. Um, and that died, and fourth quarter this year, that hit me pretty hard on the cash flow and I'm, I'm dealing with it, uh, although consumer to grow. So I'm trying to figure out how to solve that problem. So that was the main thing that stopped. Uh, what I've done so far to try to fix it uh, is LinkedIn targeting and that's actually worked pretty well from the starting point. Uh, I did some radio ads targeted as well to businesses to try to regrow that side. So when you look at your revenues, mm -hmm. what percentage is business and what percentage is PI? This, in 2020, I'd say it was about two thirds business and a third uh, PI and consumer. Although I, I expect it to be probably more 50-50 this year. Uh, okay. What do you want it to be? Do you want it to stay two thirds and one third or do you want it to go to 50-50 or do you want to go to 100% one of them? I'd, 
I've been talking to my the C-suite about this, maybe break off the marketing messages to two sides, because they're really conflicting marketing messages, like the business side doesn't really like the, the PI policyholder side, right? Uh, even though the, the general message is I'm suing insurance companies for everybody, right? Or going after them for everybody. And I'm working on that, but it, it, I'd like to break it into two different entities at some point, or marketing messages or- Why is like that. that the business people don't like the PI side? I think that with the, uh, like for example, one of my main industries is construction on the insurance side, right? So they don't like PI lawyers uh, in general, okay? So, <laughs> I mean, they just, it's their mentality. They're gonna be more conservative in general. Um, they're gonna be the type of people who call PI lawyers ambulance chasers. Um, and you got that side basically dealing with the, the avatar is way different uh, over here than over here. Okay, so what's the, the problem that we're trying to solve? Getting more business, uh, business from the business businesses. Right, because that dropped off big time, and that's, and, and I'm sure a lot of, what a lot of PI and contingency lawyers know is that the, the cash flow at the beginning, uh, getting the money going from that is okay, hard. Okay, so yeah. what are the problems that the business people have? Are they small businesses? It's small and medium, yeah. Small and businesses. Um, what are the problems that they are experiencing or they start to experience that get them to think, I need a lawyer. Uh, they get sued and insurance company doesn't defend them in the lawsuit. Sued for what? What's that? They get sued for what? Uh, could be an injury claim, it could be a liability claim of some sort. They, they're getting By sued. By an employee? It could be an employee or another company. Okay, and do you think that these problems just stopped happening because of the pandemic? Oh, they definitely didn't. Uh, okay, so then why did the business dry? Because the avenue I was primarily using to get it disappeared. Oh. Which was? Which was going to construction events, those types of things, and connecting with the people, forming relationships, and getting referrals from them. Okay, so basically you were doing referral marketing, back-end marketing with these construction people, and then you just stopped. So the answer is, how can you restart the relationships? With, where, where are these construction people, businesses? Where are they hanging out? They are somewhere. That's, they, that, that's one thing I tried, actually. And I, it, it's, at the beginning, it seems like it's working. I'm actually doing a LinkedIn targeting for construction company owners. And that's getting some feedback. Right, but LinkedIn, yes, I agree. Do that. Yeah. That's fine. But I mean with the relationships that you had already built, have you picked up the phone and called those people? I, I, more lately, yes. <laughs> but what does that mean, more likely? More lately. Or I, more lately, yes. Okay, this is what happened. You had a marketing strategy that, has, that was based on in-person contact, that you went to all these events. Then this pandemic hit and the event stopped and you stop the marketing. So if you want more of these people, what I suggest is that you call two or three of them, but what you want to ask is, you know, John, Sally, whatever their names are, um, let's talk about how are you? How has the pandemic impacted you? Where are you getting your clients right now? What are you doing? Are you working from home? Like, you need to figure out how they are connecting because they are connecting somehow, or if they are not, what you can start is a group so they connect again. So instead of waiting for somebody to put on a group that you can attend, maybe you can do a round table to discuss X, something that every construction business owner is concerned about or wants to learn about, and you become the connector you become the person that is setting up a group in Zoom, you know, it can be a launch, it can be a morning, it can be whatever. You can be the person that is bringing the people together and now you become a, an avenue of value to them. And you rebuild those relationships as, and then obviously you're going to be the go-to person that they're gonna go to because they already trust you, like you, they know you, they like you and they trust you when they have those problems with the insurance agency. So what happens with marketing is that most marketing, except things like gas calls and all of that that are very immediate, 
most marketing, you do marketing and you start seeing the, the fruits of that labor, usually a couple of months later. It usually has between two to three months until it picks up. So you stop that avenue and now you are obviously feeling the effects of that decision. So what we need to do, if that is important for you, is you start creating those events. And what you can do is that you can bring them together, you invite them, obviously I'm assuming that you have like an assistant or somebody that can help you with all of this. So gather their names, gather their information, ask them what is that they need, what are their problems? You're gonna gas call them, but not to get them necessarily as a client, you will get clients from that, but that's not the, the first objective. It's like, you know, I am thinking about setting up a networking group so we can discuss this or that and that. We're going to meet on this date, put together five, six, ten of them, send them lunch, and have a round table discussion about some topic, and then you do that every, let's say, every three weeks, every month, every two weeks, whatever you want, but you are now the gatherer, and you are the connector, and that will increase your referrals tremendously. You're going to have more business that you can think of. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, let me see what, how much time do I have. I'll take one next person in Zoom, please. Philip Crowley. Who? Philip Crowley. Oh, Crowley. Crowley, right here. Hello, Erica. Oh, there you are. Hi, Philip. All right. So, so one thing that you, what, your magic statement, what you magic start statement doing, we stop are doing passionate. And question. We are passionate about helping growing technology companies seize opportunities and avoid expensive legal mistakes as they make ideas happen. We take companies from the garage, their IPOs. Okay. The thing that I uh, did during the, uh, the pandemic made me start was uh, uh, committing to more professional marketing help and delegating more of the marketing to a professional marketing uh, person. The thing I stopped doing, which hadn't been really very effective, was in-person networking at general business events. I couldn't really identify any clients that, did, that were generated as a result of that. And the problem that I'm having is trying to develop a consistent stream of referrals from other attorneys and other legal professionals. So I haven't been able to do that. Okay. So, if I heard you correctly, you said that what the thing or the problem that you want to solve is how to develop a consistent stream of referrals from other professionals. Is that correct? That's correct. Erica. Okay. So, I am going to tell you exactly the same thing that I just told. Who was on the mic right now? Oh, Jason. Jason. Same thing. It's the same strategy. Number one, choose... Um, Talk to your CEO, and if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the marketing for the top four lists of marketing, if you don't know what I'm talking about, your CEO can help you. There are four lists when you're building your referral sources that you want to develop. So what you're going to do is that you're going to think about who are your top, or used to be, your top ten referral sources or five referral sources, whatever and choose an avatar is the same thing. I want to develop a group of, I don't know, professionals that have these things in common. You need to bring professionals that have things in common, and then you bring them together for a networking virtual opportunity, because I promise you that if you want more business, each and every one of them that is an entrepreneur also wants more business. Everybody's on the same boat, but nobody is getting out of their, their chair and doing it. They are waiting for somebody else to do it for them. So be that person, be that connector, and start creating those groups, and you are going to start getting referral sources from those people. So for all of you, this seems to be a, a, um, a common thread, right, that you need more referrals and those networking events that you use to uh, generate leads and relationships dried out with the stop of in-person events, so create them. Those are very, very powerful, okay? 
Super. Thanks, Erica. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, who's next? Are you this side? Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Sheila Manili with Manili Firm PC. We do all family law all around the all around Georgia and all around the world. About 25% of our business is international family law, and there we help multinational families navigate uh, international family conflict so our clients can move forward uh, with their dreams. Okay, can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. What does a multinational family mean? Means a uh, family that has citizenship or resides in uh, or across borders or wants to reside across borders, international borders. Okay, and they need to resolve their family law dispute in the U.S.? Um, or abroad. And often that's the question, in which country is that um, dispute going to be resolved? It's jurisdictional. It. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, my husband, the founding attorney, does that uh, under the Hague. I'll put in a plug. He's the only all-family law attorney to win a unanimous decision from the United States Supreme Court. Wow. wow. So. Good for him. Yeah. Go ahead and give it to him. He's really modest. He won't even come to the microphone so that you all can know that about him. <laughs> so I have to plug him every opportunity I can. Um, Tell so, him to stop being modest so he can help more people. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Start at stopped and challenge. So um, I think uh, this is a testimonial to what uh, Arjan said this morning. Uh, what we started was um, we clung desperately to the business plan we put in place right before COVID started. And we did not waver. Uh, we didn't let it, anything that happened scare us away from it. So we were scheduled to hire a marketing assistant and we did that. And that's been a phenomenal hire for us because before I was responsible for about four hour areas of our business plan. And having her focused on that has made a tremendous positive difference for us. Okay. Uh, we measure our metrics intensely. We're looking at leads, conversions to PCs, conversions to um, consults, conversions to clients. Can and I say something about that? Because it, this is a consistent issue that we have with all of you guys. And I'm not only looking at you. I'm all of you on the Zoom, all <laughs> of you, right? Um, remember that the gross revenues of your law firm are going to show you the value that you're delivering to the world. So if you have a $250,000 law firm, all things being equal, you're helping half the clients than if you had a $500,000 law firm. That's gross revenues. But then the profits, the net profit that you get out of your business is going to be a function of how tight of a ship you run how efficient your law firm is. And the only way to run an efficient business is with metrics. If you are not measuring conversion rates, if you're not measuring productivity of your staff, if you're not measuring util utilization rates of your staff, if you're not measuring the profit leaks of your business, you are not going to have money at the end of the day, the month, the year, et cetera. So good for you that you're measuring that. Thank you. Keep well, we, we were bumping up into a ceiling uh, of um, about two and a half million dollars. And in one year, we went to 3.6 million. So wow. It made awesome. A, it made Congratulations. Awesome in the difference. middle of the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> yes. OK. Why weren't you on the mic this morning? <laughs> Well, yes. Well, I'm here now. So okay, good. Can, I'm here now so you guys can hear it. Congratulations. Thank you. And so um, part of the marketing plan was to grow that international aspect of our business. I said it's about 25%. Uh, percent. Yes. And we were going to reach multinational families, maybe messaging at regional or smaller airports. And we were going to try to reach uh, multinational families through referrals. I think I've heard part of the answer. So other attorneys who work in international law and international business, who have international clients, who have family law issues. We really need to build that. And I think I just heard you twice give the solution um, to, to doing that better. Okay, I'm going to give you an additional nugget. Okay. I don't even know how this I like the name of the tool. I don't even remember the name, but it doesn't really matter. You want to think about your avatar. Guys, I know 
You know how they say that when you're the CEO of your business, your objective or mission is to repeat yourself ad nauseum until people hear you? That's how I feel right now. I'm going to repeat myself ad nauseum. Everything, everything, everything in your marketing starts with your avatar. If you don't have a clear avatar, you're going, your marketing is going to be like spaghetti that you are throwing to the wall and you're praying that it sticks. And 99% of it won't. So you, it, when you think about your avatar, um, you're going to do this 24 hours a day. Okay? You're going to choose one person. Think about one client that has been your dream client that if you could just work with more people like him or her for the rest of your life, you would choose that person. And then you're going to obviously define their age, their, their status, do they have children, no, from which countries, how many nationalities do they have, etc. And then you're going to do this exercise that you're going to say from um, 7 a.m., to help me divide the day in two, in four. 7 a.m. to what? Let's say noon? To 1 p.m. From 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. From 5 p.m. to, let's say, 7 p.m. So just divide the hours, okay? This is the, the, the important thing, a.m. Uh, and then you're going to think, where do they go? What do they do? Where, do, what schools? Do their kids go to what, um, well, before, maybe right now, well, gyms are starting to open again. Maybe they go to the gym. What kind of doctors they, they visit? Um, what, so you're going to follow their lives. You're going to create a profile about what they do. Where do they have dinner? Which restaurants they attend? Where do they order food from? Where do they vacation? What airlines they fly? What car rentals they use, etc. You're going to put a map of what they do. And all of these people are potential referral sources for you. All professionals that touch your same client, but most likely they touch them in a different way than you do. So maybe for other attorneys, immigration attorneys, business attorneys that work with international people or people that come to live in the United States, real estate agents that help them find houses, buy houses, sell houses. Um, I'm thinking, are you looking for net worth, high net worth individuals? Yes. Yeah, so think about car dealerships, think okay. about boat clubs, clubs. Think about um, like high-end stuff. And what you want to then start doing, besides what you told me, is to start finding, become a, a resource for these people and build relationships. Guys, marketing, it's 100% about relationships. Relationship with the marketplace, relationship with potential new clients, relationship with pro potential referral sources, and you become really intentional about being in those um, communities and becoming a resource for those people. Now, I understand that when you do this, you're going to have a thousand ideas. Choose one. Start with one. You develop that avenue, and when you feel that you've really, I don't want to say saturated, but you've gotten you know, known and you're getting a good referral sources from that, you go to the next, and then you go to the next, and then you go to the next. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And Tom, I think that somebody answered your question on the chat, but her name is Sheila Manili. Somebody was asking. Manili? Manili. Manili. Thank you. Okay. Do I have one more person from the Zoom? Oh, I have two minutes. Um, Julie, do I, I only have two minutes. Three minutes? Okay. Uh, one more person from the Zoom. Let's be quick. Laura, if you want to contact her, um, call your CEO. They can help you. 
we will ask her and then she'll decide if we can put them in contact. Yes. Who do I have on the Zoom? Tammy Reynolds. Tammy. Actually, this is Tammy. This is Dan, but she nominated me to talk. So <laughs> okay. my name is Dan, Daniel. Dan Reynolds. Um, yep. We're in Portland, Oregon. We represent good people facing DUI charges. DUI is all we do. Um, okay, I can't, hold on. I can't hear. Good people what? We represent good people facing DUI charges. Got it. Thank you. Um, ultimately, our issue is that uh, the queries for DUI searches, DUI related searches are down about 30% this year. Our pay-per-click cost has gone up 300% this year um, because there just is not, there's simply not as many people being arrested. Mm -hmm. um, we've tightened down a lot of our processes. We've looked for different ways internally. The only thing we've got right now is to go out of the metro area that we're in and start to explore uh, smaller jurisdictions and, and start to spread that way. At least that's our that's our thought process. We'd love to hear any other ideas along the way, though. Um, what else are you doing besides PPC? Or do you want me to talk specifically about PPC? Now, we do radio. Uh, we do direct mail. Um, we do web. Social media. Social media, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that I would say something similar to you that I said to everyone else. If your PPC cost has gone all up 300% and you see that the searches on the keywords, I'm assuming that you were using keywords, or maybe PPC you're using Facebook or whatever, um, have gone down by 30%, I think you said, um, it might be a moment in which you want to start expanding in different in different uh, social media avenues or with different messages or with something more organic that do not necessarily has to be paid. So I would say to you something similar to what I said to, to Ron Pollack. Start using different avenues of social media if that's what you want to do and we're talking about online. You already heard all the, not all, but some of the strategies that you can use with, you can use with uh, referral marketing to build your referral sources. I would love for you to do that, but I also know that DUI has a lot to do with, I need this, this, this uh, journey right now. So think about where do people, where do people go or what do people do when they are, you know, going, they have the highest likelihood to have arrest for the UI. And this is, in my opinion, I don't know, let me know if you are, I'm wrong. I think it, it is also has to do with a lot of mass marketing. So maybe putting, just being there available when the situation happens. So maybe, how, how big is your firm, your gross revenues? Uh, about $2 million in 2020. Okay, good, perfect. So start looking into social media avenues, um, dealing to building your email list and, and being able to build a relationship with these people. But you can also start thinking about more mass marketing ideas like Dustin was talking about, like radio. Um, I don't know with TV, I'm not a fan, but a lot of people say that it works. But something like that, that radio advertisement, billboards advertisement, TV advertisement, as long as, obviously, you are tracking the, the process and you are definitely measuring the ROI. And when you're tracking the process and measuring the ROI, you don't want to think only about, well, I spent, let's say, $1 per each one of the leads that I got, and then I got $1.3 out of it because that's from the first purchase but everybody that you build in, bring into your world most likely will have, well, most likely, will have either referrals or repeat business. So you want to think, what is the long-term value of my clients? So if I look at all my past clients or the past clients that I've had, I don't know. Who's your CEO? Uh, we don't have one yet. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We don't have one yet. 
Oh my goodness, why? Um, we are about to embrace that process. Oh, okay, so you just joined HTM and you're in SLFU? Longer story, but we're in line. Okay, good, whatever, okay. Once you get your advisor, whether it's an SLFU, you can absolutely do it with your guidance counselor, it's an SLFU, 100% can help you. The other option is maybe you come into C-suite and they can help you also. So what you need is a guidance to help you set up the, the, the process correctly because what I would like you to do is to do an analysis of your, the lifetime value of your customers. All the customers that you've had, how much was the value of their first purchase and how much have of them, how many of them have they purchased again and what was the second purchase? If the second purchase has not happened, or you're not getting a lot of referrals from previous clients, what you're doing is you're sitting in a pot of gold, and you're just spending your money online. So I'm not saying that you don't do online, but I'm saying I would focus also with your CEO on hitting your list of past clients of people that already like you, know you, and trust you. I would start there.